said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now, you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now, water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Yes, be water, my friend. <laughs> Words by the late, great Bruce Lee. Um, I know he's talking about martial arts, but this is definitely a quote that kind of can be applicable to all forms of life. Um, it's definitely something that kind of governed a lot of my decision making and kind of helped guide me through uh, my life's journey. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'll kind of start back, not super far back, but pretty far back. Um, I'm Everett, as Michelle said, and I'm a failed musician. Um, I grew up playing music. It's part of my life. I started playing classical piano, uh, like most good Asian kids would do to kind of appease their parents. Um, I was a band geek, kind of graduated from playing piano to marching band with a saxophone um, into high school as well. And this was my first like real quote unquote band in high school. Uh, we thought we were super cool. This is us playing again at my, my Chinese friend's uncle's 70th birthday. <laughs> so we thought we had made it. This is like big time, right? Like we're, we're gonna get signed and all this stuff. Um, so I very much thought that music um, would be my career path, but it definitely was a big part of my life and my identity. Um, it still is today. Um, but I think that as I was kind of going through this journey, kind of playing music and trying to make it work, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of pivots that I made, a lot of kind of zigs and zags, and hopefully some of these experiences might resonate with some of you. So this is a young 20-something me. Um, <laughs> pretty much sums up my attitude, at least at the time, towards a lot of things. Um, even though I'm like older and a lot more buttoned up, I think there's a lot about this picture that still kind of is with me, aside from flipping everyone the bird. Um, I'm a lot calmer these days, but um, there's something about this kind of punk rock ethos that I grew up that actually like really stayed with me in my professional career and helped kind of get me through a lot of difficult um, situations. Uh, but as I mentioned, I started off in the music industry Right after high school, I kind of immediately went to study recording engineering. Um, I kind of wanted to be like this guy. Does anyone know who this is? Like, just shout it out if you know him. George yeah, George Martin, one person. Man, I feel like super old up here. But um, <laughs> pretty much, George Martin was the fifth Beatle, right? He's kind of like responsible for shaping not just the Beatles, but a lot of different bands' sounds inside of the studio. Um, and that was pretty amazing as a, as a young kind of musician. I was like, you know, I could play music or I could also like be involved in collaborating with a lot of different artists. I'm working in the studio and putting out hits. Um, so I went and en enrolled in recording engineering program. Kind of once I finished that, I did like anyone would do, just kind of pound the pavement, started knocking on doors and talking to all kinds of different people. Um, eventually I got a gig as a junior engineer at this recording studio in Melrose. It was kind of like this tiny little hole in the wall. And uh, I thought that I had made it again. I was like, yes, I'm gonna be like hanging out with people in the studio, like making cool tracks or whatever. Um, but in my head, that's what I thought. But I think on paper, it actually was a little bit more grindy and a little bit, honestly, like a lot more technical of role than I thought. I thought it would be like much more creative. I mean, I should have known it said like recording engineering, like directly in the title. Um, so yeah, I was grinding away and on top of that, just like, working with artists and like creative folk, you know, like we're all kind of fussy people in particular. Um, so a lot of it was just about kind of capturing their vision versus like having creative input into some of that stuff. Um, I was working sessions that were midnight to 10 in the morning. I was kind of grinding it out. And as like a 19, 20 something year old, kind of like floating around Hollywood, I like didn't have too much ambition. Like nothing was really motivating me. It kind of was like down a little bit about uh, my career choice. So long story short, I'm cutting out a lot of details here, but um, around this time, I found out that I was gonna be a father. Um, a lot of folks, in, at least in the design world, know me as a dad. Um, my daughter, Drew, pretty much grew up in this, um, in this environment, design at least. Um, but pre-Drew, I was on a very different trajectory. Like I said, I was kind of doing the music thing, and this was like the first major pivot in my life. Um, I mean, having a kid is for anyone, but being like super young and even more important, like being crazy broke, um, it kind of lights a fire under your ass and like you really have to think about, you know, the decisions that you make. I mean, definitely you're gonna 
be supporting and providing for a family, kind of raising this little thing into something that has its own opinions. So there's a lot of stuff that I had to think about. I kind of took a long, hard look in the mirror and was like, you know, music is, is like a passion of mine, but you know, at least trying to grind it out didn't um, seem as, as stable. So kind of thought, what could I go into that might be a little bit more stable and ideally a little bit more lucrative. Uh, just for kicks, this is my daughter. She really hates this when I do this. Like, I kind of post these side-by-side -side photos of this kind of serendipitous moments. So, like, I took this photo of her. She's a bass player. Um, she's actually playing tonight. Um, so thank you all for making me miss my daughter's gig. Um, <laughs> this is us at the same age, 13-year-old uh, Everett, 13-year-old Drew. Um, this is our band, both of our bands at the same age, so 15 years old. Uh, so even though I kind of put music on the shelf professionally, I don't make any money, and if anything, I kind of lose a ton of money on it. Um, I'm able to live vicariously through my daughter, so you know that's, I guess, one of the, one of the joys of fatherhood. Um, but anyhow, I guess, you know, little Drew is coming. I kind of needed to make a move. I was grinding it out, and again, I kind of took a long, hard look in the mirror, being young and naive, and again, more importantly, super broke. Um, I decided to take out a huge student loan and go to a fancy art school. So like, what can go wrong, right? Like, <laughs> seriously though, it's, it sounds easy enough. Study art, get a degree, get paid, right? Um, but we all know it's like not as linear as that. Um, and that's a lot of what like my talk is about. It's like this, not non-linear necessarily in, in your design decisions, but just kind of being fluid with your path in life as Master Bruce so eloquently stated. Uh, so this is my grad show, two kind of four, uh, four by eight sheets of foam core to kind of showcase four years of like blood, sweat, and tears. So it's kind of a, a weird anticlimactic way to sum up your education. Um, I won't show you any of like my really shitty student work, um, but more so what I want to emphasize was like my approach to my education and kind of how I I went about um, taking classes. I guess I pretty much studied, uh, uh, took as many kind of non-design classes as possible. Um, even though I was declared a graphic design major, I took like fine art, photography, filmmaking, um, kind of anything that was like remotely kind of interesting, aside from design, which is kind of weird because that's what I went there to study. Um, and I didn't do it strategically, like to be this kind of well-rounded person. Like, if anything, it's like um, just evidence of like how my ADD kind of governs a lot of my decisions. I just kind of am a little bit erratic, but I was scratching my creative itch in different directions. So, consequently, my grad show was pretty random. Um, it was definitely different from other people's, but um, in that sense, like everyone had these beautiful like vector illustrations and like this impeccably set Swiss typography that was like kind of on this angle. Um, and mine was just a bunch of crap that I made, you know, with my hands. Uh, and, you know, even though it was very much a reflection of me, it was, uh, I still kind of had like this identity crisis as a, as a designer, like who am I? Um, I'm not a photographer, but I have lots of photography. I had photogravure, I had like screen printed posters. I lived in this print shop down there. I had packaging, tons of random stuff. Um, so I think it was, it was difficult for myself to kind of um, come out and talk about, you know, how I would be, I guess, like marketable as a, as a new hire or a candidate or something like that. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with this idiom. A jack of all trades is a master of none. Um, this kind of like loomed over me like a dark cloud, I guess. Like, uh, if you think about this, uh, this idiom today, it actually kind of has a derogatory slant. Like, someone that's good at lots of things, they're probably not like a master at any one thing. They don't, don't do that one thing super well. Um, and that's kind of how I thought of myself. I was like, man, why can't I just focus on one thing and be super kick-ass at that thing? Um, and I guess that's just not the way that I'm wired, and I'm sure a lot of people are not wired that way. You know, um, there are definitely people that can devote their life's work in every waking minute to something. Um, it's not me. Um, but as I kind of like dug deeper into this idiom, because you know it's something that just kind of rang in my head for for years, um, I kind of conveniently found this uh, like the second half of this thing that we've omitted over time. So jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. So this made me feel a lot better. I was like, oh man, 
I think back when this phrase was coined, it was actually a good thing. People saw it as something positive. Um, but again, like a lot of people that I kind of tell this to today, they're like, oh, I didn't know there was a second half to that thing. Um, <laughs> and this kind of, uh, again, like made me feel a lot better about having lots of, uh, of different skills and a, a diverse kind of background because you know, it's not like a handyman, like you're kind of changing light bulbs. It's like you're kind of a renaissance man. You can do a lot of different things, so it's cool. Um, and eventually over time, I kind of learned to embrace this and even kind of market myself as a designer. Like every time I kind of um, interview at new places, I'm not looking for a job, but I'm pretty happy with where I'm at. But whenever I'm talking to folks, I'm like, you know, I can wear lots of different hats, and that's actually an asset versus like I'm the best blankety blank. But kind of being this young, kind of wide-eyed, um, fresh grad, neck deep in student loans, I guess, I thought this is what I had to do, climb this ladder and kick and claw and do all that stuff. So junior, mid-level, senior, this is the very kind of linear approach. And um, it's definitely not my, uh, my experience. You know, and I think a lot of this stuff doesn't really exist these days. I mean, there's definitely um, jobs and institutions that you'll have to climb up this hierarchy. But I think for the most part, in this thing that we do, and especially in this city here, um, you know, people can kind of carve out their own journeys and like find, find these different streams that they can follow. Um, so a lot of my kind of career, career uh, decisions were kind of definitely nonlinear and bouncing around with this. And I've held different titles, and I've held no titles. Uh, but the kind of trick to it is just kind of being fluid within these situations and being true to yourself as a creative folk. So I started here. This was like my first gig right out of school. This is the J. Paul Getty Museum. Um, I was an exhibition designer there. I didn't have any experience in exhibition design, but again, kind of um, working at the, at the um, Art Center College, I was like able to dabble in a lot of things. So I guess I had an aptitude for making things. I thought this was like the bomb place. For me, this was the shit, because it was... Uh, like this travertine castle on the hill in Brentwood, and it was like hanging out with curators, and we're sipping cappuccinos and like doing all this fine art stuff, and it was very highbrow. Um, but I also thought the recording studio was the bomb, and I thought like playing my friend's grandpa's gig was pretty awesome too. So, kind of again, just a different journey. So I got to cut my teeth, like learning the trade, exhibition design, environmental graphics, and immersive narratives. Um, I had this aptitude for making things, but again, it was here where I really learned how to detail and draw things for production. Um, so just kind of being a sponge and soaking up these different, uh, these different aspects of design um, and trying to fold that into who I was as like, you know, essentially a graphic designer with a pretty erratic um, sense of interest. So just a cross section of this digital stereoscopic viewer that I made. So what was exciting about this was I got to prototype things model them. This was an early SketchUp model, but we would make things with foam core and then kind of see them installed in the gallery next door. So it was this kind of like immediate thing and it was very visceral and I learned a lot and it was a very um, essentially like a protected space working at the museum. Um, so again, I thought this was like the best thing, you know, I was working with art and it was like super, uh, super rewarding. But if any of you all have spent any time in LA, you know, there's this like big dragon that's like slowly killing everyone there. Uh, and it's the, this traffic that just kind of serpentines throughout the Southland. Uh, and I would drive 15 miles each way to work, which is not a ton, although it's bigger than two San Francisco's. Um, and it would take me two hours each way, so like four hours of traffic, which is pretty gnarly. Um, on top of that, here's a news flash, like museum workers like don't get paid super well, uh, which was kind of the the antithesis of why I went to school and study. Again, like, I wasn't intending to get rich as a designer, but, um, you know, I had a family to support, and I, if that was the case, I might have well just stayed working in the studio. So one of my mentors in design school kind of gave me this advice, which was not really design-related at all, but, um, and I'm going to murder how he gave it to me, but he just said, kind of, you know, figure out where, where in this world you want to live, um, which city, which country, and move there. That was pretty much his advice. Um, but the gist of it was, um, 
to be comfortable in your surroundings. And then he followed up and said, you know, don't move somewhere for a job. You know, if you're not completely happy with it, um, you're going to be miserable because, you know, you're just not going to be comfortable in your own skin. Oops. So I guess I revealed that one. But anyway, so <laughs> I was in L.A. for a long time, sitting in traffic, uh, had a ton of time to think and contemplate life. And, uh, yeah, I knew that L.A. was kind of over it. Um, I'd been born and raised there. Um, and I, yeah, just kind of packed up and shopped my portfolio around to all these places. Uh, most of the places were pretty much like other museums, architecture firms, and then this was the, the one tech company that actually kind of gave me a shot, and you know, I'm forever grateful for them, but I also still have no reason why they hired me. Like, I can't understand that, because I had an exhibition design portfolio, this kind of fine art background. It was like this bro -y tech company. Um, <laughs> So when I started there, there was no, no marketing design, no communication design. There was a handful of interactive designers, but it was predominantly an engineering co uh, company. And it was growing, it, you know, it was growing pretty rapidly, but you know, they were smaller than Twitter. Uh, I think one of, one of our colleagues um, back in the day said that we were committing career suicide by going here. It was, you know, that's how kind of like weird and, and unknown, unknown, this, unknown this world was. Uh, in hindsight, after kind of going through this a few times, um, meaning a couple different companies, there's a sweet spot that, that I really thrive and that kind of helps me do my best work. Um, this is an oversimplified graph, you know, but, you know, there's definitely early stage where people are, um, you know, they're very focused, but they're super impactful, but they also have to be like, um, like pretty, pretty focused with how they spend their resources and time. And there's a still kind of early stage, but you're kind of out of these startup weeds, but you know, you got a lot of momentum, but you just need a lot of muscle to help do stuff. That, that's the, the part of a company that I really enjoy. And then it gets big, and then you're huge. Um, so I think when I started Facebook, it was a couple hundred people, which is like a medium-sized company. Um, but as I left, there was 8,000 people, and that was over the course of five years. And I th Michelle would know better, but now I think there's officially like a shit ton of people that work there. <laughs> Uh, so this was the early marketing design team. Um, there was five of us. <laughs> it's me, I'm wearing a SpongeBob tie. Um, the design org, well, the design team back then was like less than 10 people. I think there was a handful of product designers and then we broke off and became the marketing design, which is now like basically an agency within the company. But I don't know how many people are just in the design org alone, but I think it's several hundred, which is pretty insane. <clears throat> Uh, we did a lot of public facing work, a lot of you know more typical marketing design like landing pages and videos and stuff. Uh, but one of the things I get asked about a lot, like ironically wasn't anything that people got to really see. Um, and it was this thing called the Analog Research Lab. Uh, it was pretty much just a fancy name for a print shop. So this is Ben Barry and I, um, we're the co-founders of this space. And it was, again, two of us were like these fish out of water designers. Um, Ben had just come fresh out of Austin. He was working in a screen printing shop. I came from the museum again with like a printmaking background though, and two of us were like in a sea of engineers and just both like really kind of blown away with like what the hell are we doing here? Um, but also like kind of just trying to make it work. So um, what business did we have inside of a tech company? You know, we were just being like sponges, you know, and even though like analog is kind of the antithesis of this technological mindset, but we didn't know better. And I think that that worked out in our favor. We were just soaking up this engineering culture, soaking up this hacker mentality and using like means that we knew best, which was like essentially guerrilla tactics to kind of express this stuff in a, in a visual language that started to eventually click with um, the engineers at Facebook. And, I think um, post Facebook companies now, it's, it's become a little bit more acceptable to have this kind of more street art language. This is me with my linoleum like button. Super happy that I cut that out of linoleum. Um, this was our first kind of office door, which is like just this floating door, like Howl's Moving Castle. Um, people always ask me like, how did we get approval for this stuff? Or what were your budgets like? And how did you um, kind of pitch these projects to people? Um, and the answer was we didn't, we just did stuff. Um, so this is Ben Barry. Um, ben Barry and I stayed up a couple nights when we were designing some of the first conferences for Facebook. Um, you know, we just wanted to kind of bring what we were doing inside of the company out into the world, out into the developer community. We didn't have any budgets. No one was telling us 
like, well, no one was telling us not to do this, but no one was asking us, like, hey, can you guys design all this stuff? Um, we just bought a ton of wood, oftentimes kind of out of our own pocket, and we stayed up all night screen printing things and putting stuff together. Um, and then we would just install stuff. So this is what the inside of the, um, of the event space looked like. This was the concourse. Um, and again, it's not about like the design. I'm not trying to emphasize that. It's more about the approach to things and partly being naive, but also partly trying to push forward things that we thought were really interesting. And we were just trying to make a lot of things happen. So again, engineers, um, specifically at Facebook, but the broader developer community really kind of took to this aesthetic and I think embraced it as, as their own. We even got them involved in making a lot of stuff. So this is uh, this assembly line that we had of people soldering Arduinos and we made this NFC experience inside of the event. But all of this done was like hacked together by us. Like I made the pedestals and the acrylic casing. So again, I think a more linear path would be, let's find like this event production place and like let's rent a bunch of tables and have like these tablecloths and stuff. And it probably would have been like more straightforward or kind of corporate. Um, so I think we were able to push and do something interesting there. Just more stuff. I just make a lot of stuff, like sign paint things and kind of stick them in the middle of the office. Um, the calling card for the lab was these red typographic posters. Um, you know, they're always kind of changing, but whenever we'd hear something in a meeting or in an all hands or something like that, um, we would immediately go to the off uh, into the lab. We would screen print it. At night, we would wheat paste it on the door, and then someone would come in the next day and be like, "Whoa, who's doing all this stuff?" Um, over time, it kind of became like this, this landmark and, and like a big cornerstone of Facebook culture. But again, back then it was actually like pretty provocative and contentious. Uh, but I knew that it was pretty, uh, something that's pretty lasting when I guess like years after I had left, I was like scrolling through my news feed and uh, I saw this photo, which is kind of like my mic drop moment. <laughs> I would drop this, but it's not mine. Um, <laughs> Miley Cyrus kind of laid out in the analog research lab and. I think like I can retire as champ. That's like my, <laughs> I'll never uh, exceed this in my career. Um, but anyways, yeah, I think whether you love or, fa or hate Facebook, um, you know, there's no kind of denying that it, it's a company that was very unconventional and didn't kind of um, succumb to like being the status quo. So I still have this very dear thing to me called music, which I put on the shelf. Um, you know, with all the design stuff, I was able to kind of fold in some of my new skills that I went to design school for, but I still had music there with me. Um, and I tried to kind of weave it into my professional practice as much as possible. This is so dumb. I don't even know why I'm showing this to you guys, but it's there anyways. Um, so I don't know if any of you guys play music. So Facebook was um, launching their first version of video calling which had a Skype integration, you know, so naturally it's gonna need these ringtones and notifications, so I volunteered to do the sound design for them. Um, so I was able to apply my musical background um, just in a very different context. And if any of you guys play music, you know what this spells. It spells face, and it was so self-evident and so dumb, but also like just worked so well with all of the ringtone things that um, I kind of had to like run with this thing. So again, if that wasn't enough, I think there's a lot of conceptual things that I, I baked into here. Um, I'll kind of run you through some of these things. So there's a couple intervals here that are interesting. Obviously, major third intervals. Um, major thirds are like the most common kind of ringtone interval. So, right, that's like a major third trill. Um, but it also had this minor third in it, like descending C to an A. Um, you know, a lot of doorbells are like this. Um, but there's this mnemonic trigger that happens specifically with these two notes that hopefully a lot of you guys know, otherwise I'll feel super old about this, but. So Lassie, just like Facebook, your friends calling you home um, through Facebook video chat. Um, <laughs> so this is how I pitched like the early audio identity just kind of walking people through the motif. So nothing 
revelatory just for me. I was like, it spells phase, can't you tell? But no one could tell, right? <laughs> so this was just the initial pitch, and then since then, like, we did all these iterations and brought the Lassie thing into it. But this is just what I showed early on. So I'd kind of done, like, the, the print shop, doing environmental design, now doing sound design. Um, and as I kind of showed in the beginning, there's this like stage of the company that, that I think I really thrive. I didn't know that at the time, but you know, Facebook was growing pretty big. I left at about 8,000 people. Um, and I kind of just knew that I wanted to go back and try and do this again at a different company. So I got a job at this place, it's Pinterest. It's very different than when I started at Facebook. It actually was a lot smaller. Um, there were about 50 people when I started. Uh, I was the first, I was a brand design manager at the time, but the team was relatively small, but a lot of my, um, my role was like hiring and managing folks and building out this creative function. And part of it was me trying to um, do something else, or trying to wear a different hat through management, um, which I thought, again, was what you had to do, right? A lot of people think, well, how do I move up as a designer? Like, maybe eventually they'll have to manage people. Sometimes it's not a good idea. Um, if you're not a good manager, it's a very different skill, which I learned the hard way. Um, this was my desk when I first moved into Pinterest. <laughs> Literally, uh, I parked myself in the middle of this warehouse. So they, they still have this space, but now they've grown big enough where they occupy multiple spaces throughout the Soma. Um, but having this environmental design background, um, probably one of my first tasks that I did was sit down and kind of live with the architects and help envision this space, like very kind of viscerally sitting in there and trying to imagine it. This was our first meeting space. This was the design team at the time, you know, and it was definitely not up to code, so someone here was an architect. Um, don't, don't tell the, the city or anything. Um, but we were a seven-person design team. By the time I left, it was about 11-ish people, and now, again, they're kind of into org territory. Um, we hired all, dis all different disciplines of creative folk. Skip was a filmmaker. We had illustrators. Um, and I was managing them. Eventually, towards, towards the end of my tenure there, um, I moved back into individual contributor work, um, and I hired this guy, Brian Singer. Um, so yeah, I guess um, I found out that management wasn't my thing, but you know, I was still trying to, trying to make things work with, within the company. My role was like, pretty strategic at the time, which again was something different than just like, making stuff. So, working with researchers, trying to figure out demographic stuff, segmentation and messaging and things like that. Um, but you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're building this company, we're building a brand that people use all the time, um, but we're also building a company that employs a lot of people. So liking, like, wanting to focus more on internal culture, I think I spent a lot of time helping build out kind of what, what the working environment is at Pinterest. Um, if you think back to the Facebook analog research laboratory stuff, um, it didn't quite make sense on paper as to like why you're doing this at this specific company, but it made a ton of sense here at Pinterest, right? Like everyone's looking through Pinterest to find creative ideas and kind of be a little bit crafty, be a little bit more creative in their day to day. So I was able to lead a lot of their early versions of hackathons, which we called makeathons. I mean, people would just kind of embrace the product, find interesting things, and like make posters. They were people were cooking and stuff, so. It's very Pinteresty, um, but again, being like any good designer, kind of felt that I had done this before, like doing the makery thing, internal culture, and I'm um, trying to push myself to do more creative and interesting things. I'm um, also having a team to kind of help do a lot of the the heavy conceptual lifting. And um, this next project is actually like my favorite my favorite thing in the world, next to Miley Cyrus on the Analog Lab. But uh, so this is what we called the Pinnebago. <laughs> If some of you guys were here last, you know Laura Bruno Miner. Um, she actually designed a lot of the, the branding and the swag. Um, it's a Pinnebago. Uh, we drove it across the country. Originally, it started as a getaway to get people from San Francisco to South by Southwest, because we were a super cheap company at the time. Um, and then eventually, it turned into this roving creative studio on wheels, and now this like beacon for creativity. It's a Pinnebago. Um, Skip was a filmmaker, he was on the road, and he was filming little vignettes about everyone, and he was producing these things and putting them out in real time. We were stopping at all of these interesting places along the way and having creative meetups with different folks there. So it was, I mean, personally, it was pretty, uh, pretty exciting and, and energizing creatively, but also kind of everyone that touched this, we sprinkled a little bit of Pinterest dust on them, and it was super fun. 
These are the piñata letters, uh, if you saw them in Laura. <laughs> they love puns there, so pinabago, piñata. Um, this is the crew. Um, if you've ever been to South by Southwest, you know, you, you know that like Spotify is flying in Snoop Dogg and then, like everyone's kind of having these mega parties and then all of a sudden this like Winnebago rolls by and then we just pull out a keg and like put it on the street, you know. So that was our, again, like our ghetto scrappy way of trying to, to have a presence at South by Southwest. We stopped in Marfa, Texas, which is pretty cool if any of you guys have been there, um, having creative meetups. I'll show you this overview video, but um, some of these things we incorporated into like our actual work. So we'd play music and score, score stuff in real time to the, the stuff that we put out. I don't know why we thought that was cool. Pinning out of letters in the Grand Canyon. That was it. So, some work I did for Pinterest. Um, again, Pinterest is growing, it's still growing. Um, there's a couple thousand people, again, uh, here just in the, in the Soma alone. Um, and between Facebook and Pinterest, I had kind of been grinding and getting a little bit burnt out. And I kind of took a step back and again, had to reassess like where I wanted to go next in my career. So I worked a couple little things here and there, but eventually I ended up where I'm at now, which is at Stripe. Some of my fellow Stripes are here. Um, it's a financial technology company, so you would think that it's got a pretty buttoned up culture, you know, and for the most part, they're um, conservative. It's, I, I tell people it's the sanest company, like everyone's pretty sane there, which is kind of weird to say because Facebook and Pinterest were these eclectic cultures. Um, but here again, at a relatively early stage of the company, kind of at the same, uh, same inflection point of when I was at Facebook, um, and I'm still able to call on my different skills to, again, help have impact and contribute to, to the creative team and push things into different directions. I still focus a lot on internal culture, so we have a, a Reza graph. Um, thanks to Tim Balonix, if you've seen Tim Balonix here as well, I think Tim is like single-handedly responsible for the renaissance of the Reza graph in the Bay Area, I think. Um, he's a pretty awesome, awesome designer. 
And also shout out to Donald Trump for continuously giving me fodder to make more posters. Um, <laughs> this is my family, a little baby girl Drew right here. Um, some stripes tooling up to go down to the Women's March, which is also happening this weekend, 2018. Um, again, getting back in the studio, I'm working with sound designers, doing stuff for animated pieces here, I'm recording a foreign language overdub. Um, so nothing necessarily different than what I've done before. I'm just able to be a little bit more deliberate about it. Um, but for the most part, I'm kind of reinventing myself here as a filmmaker. Uh, you know, I do some design projects here and there, but I think I'm able to focus on one medium and kind of coming from this jack of all tra trades mindset. Um, I mean, filmmaking has a lot of different roles underneath it, but for the most part, it's like a, a very specific type of storytelling. And I don't know, maybe I'm just getting older, you know, and uh, I think I, I want to be able to focus. Um, but I think strengthening these skills has actually like re-energized me creatively versus like if I was just doing more graphic design thing. I think I kind of have, have moved into a different area of, of being a creative individual. So learning how to operate cameras, again, doing production audio again, um, shooting a lot of documentary type stuff and testimonial videos. I thought I turned the audio off there, but this is slow motion stuff and shooting in Shibuya. Yeah, so again, I think that's a, a large part of my day today on top of like building this internal culture. So. I've been fortunate enough to, and also I guess like naive enough to continually try and reinvent myself. And sometimes I feel like I'm starting over again. But at the same time, I've learned to embrace that that's the way my brain works. Um, and I just kind of now own up to that stuff. And I think it's actually been an asset versus to be a detriment. Um, so bringing it back to my younger self, um, it's difficult to maintain your sense of self, I guess, in, especially in this world, in this environment here that's like rapidly changing especially inside of a company that is very different from when you start and like six months later, it could be something completely different. Um, but I like to think that this dude here is still with me and he helps guide me through complicated adult decisions, right? And just kind of helps me power through a lot of things. So to bring it back to my man, Bruce over here, uh, be like water, my friends. Um, I think the main thing is instead of trying to shape the world around you to fit your expectations, Try letting the environment shape you and be a little bit more fluid in there, like Master Bruce says. And the trick, again, is trying to stay authentic to yourself, but as you're evolving and changing over time. <laughs>